Yeah. Really, real feel it right there. It's real good. Some of you are like, what's wrong with you, Bears fan? So if you're like, oh, yeah, it explains everything, shut up. Uh, real quick, before I jump off this morning, last week we it was Pastor Appreciation, and I messed up, and I forgot to mention somebody, even though I had them on my notes. So uh, today I want to honor Alyssa. Is she in here? Right there. So Alyssa is our children's director now, and uh, she's doing a fabulous job at it. Um, just new ideas, innovative, bringing new people in. So really appreciate her and all that she has been doing. Another one that told me like when she came, um, yeah, I'm not going to do anything when I come. And I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. All good. And then little by little, like just it's there, you know, when you're called, man, you just can't run from it even as hard as you try. And so what's cool too is having a listen here or, uh, in children's now allows Pastor Christine to be in here. And so, man, if during worship, if you're just in need of somebody to pray and agree with you, uh, Pastor Christine would love to do that. Or at the end of service, if there's something that's really kind of stirred your heart and you just want to pray with somebody about it, I would encourage you to grab, pa- I'm, I'm out as soon as church is, I'm going out there because I just need a minute. You don't want to pray with me after I get done preaching. My breath's probably bad anyway. So, um, But she'll be here for that and I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, so we're going to start this brand new series, and you know, like when pastors do that, they're usually like, man, I am so excited, and I just can't wait for this, and nope, that's not it uh, at all, because I did a series like this uh, a couple of years ago, and it messed me up, and so you want to just be real honest, like this series freaks me out, um, because it's everything I'm not really comfortable with, uh, so it's probably doing it right, right? So that's dumb, but uh, y'all know what I'm talking about. So as we kick it off, I just want to remind you that we do have groups starting this week, and if you haven't had a chance to sign up for one, you're more than welcome to. But understand me, like this church isn't one where like everybody needs to be in a group. Um, I don't necessarily believe that. I believe there's a lot of people in this room, you've got different seasons and rhythms of your life, and maybe groups don't necessarily work for you, but I do believe this, everybody needs some level of community to follow Jesus with, right? Because if you're just doing it by yourself, you're only as good as you, and that's not, well, for me, that's not very good, right? I need more than that. I need people to speak into my life. I want the opportunity to speak into other people's lives. And so if you're not in a group, I would just encourage you to make sure you have some level of community in your life where people can speak into that. But if you want to be in a group, there's like three of them, I think, happening. Um, There's one on Monday morning, uh, the ladies group, not ladies, it's open to everybody. It's at the coffee shop, so really good coffee, uh, Manswa coffee, so there's one, uh, Joey's is on Tuesday night, Monday nights, oh, Monday morning and Monday night, and then my buddy Dave has got one on Thursday night, and I'm not in one because I'm in this journey group where we're going through our feelings and stuff, and that's great. <laughs> it really is good, but... We'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, so a, a couple of years ago, we did this series called Below the Water Line, um, and just kind of this idea of this iceberg, right? And like that, and have you heard this before? Like 10% of what people see is what's above the water line, but 90% of what they don't see is what's below, and it's what below that kind of messes everybody up. It's like what's below is what sank the Titanic, um, And our lives have similarities that most of what people see is just a small percentage of who we really are. And that was such a fun series where we like started to go below and started to get in our feelings and all that kind of stuff. And I was so uncomfortable um, because it's just not me. It's not something that I've ever done. And so, uh, yeah, so when I kind of felt led back to this thing, I was like, no, like, like you ever feel like God tells you to do something? You're like, thank you. No, thank you. Um, can we just preach on Jesus or something? Like, how about something else, right? What about Revelation? Let's just go there. We could just right through that, and that would be awesome. Uh, but no, I felt like this was something. And so, but, but I felt like it needed to go beyond that. So the series we're doing now is called Building Below the Waterline. And I think the title where this comes from is really cool. I heard this story, and it kind of inspired me. Um, so that's the plans for the Brooklyn Bridge, Okay. Uh, and it connects, if you're not familiar, the Brooklyn Bridge connects New York to Manhattan. Um, it was the first susp- suspension bridge like that ever built. Uh, it's just some cool facts about it. Uh, it, it was the, a steel sus- suspension bridge. It was 1,600 feet between these two towers. They, they started in 1870, 
And for a time, it was the largest structure on the planet. It took 13 years to build this, 600 workers over the span of 13 years. But in May of 1872, there was a controversy. Started in 1870, in May of uh, 1872, they had a controversy that broke out. See, what had happened was the Brooklyn Tower, um, to build this bridge, they had to get into the water and they had to find rock. And so the Brooklyn Tower, it took them 40, 44, 48 feet, 44 feet before they found rock and began to build up. However, the New York Tower, it took 78 feet. And the, literally the way they did it is if you like took a glass, flipped it upside down, pushed it into a bathtub, you know how there's like air? That's kind of what they did. And they put a hose there and men would go down and dig through the muck and the mire to get to rock because they understood if they didn't hit rock, it wasn't going to last, right? And so here was the controversy. Um, in 72, the, the Brooklyn Tower was about 20 some feet above the waterline. And they saw nothing on the New York Tower. And people started to complain, saying, what's going on? What do you mean? Like, aren't you guys working? What's, what's happening over here? Why are we paying all this money? And so the chief engineer responded to the critics with this statement. He said, to such of the general public as might imagine, no work had been done on the New York Tower because they see no evidence of it above the water. I would simply remark that the amount of masonry and concrete laid on that foundation during the past winter underwater is equal in quantity to the entire masonry of the Brooklyn Tower visible today above the waterline. So where this series is coming from is this. Some of us, if we're going to let God do what he wants to do in our life, we got to dig down deep because we got some stuff in our life that we got to work our way through to get to some rock. And I think what the problem for me and a lot of other people is we take the surface stuff way too easy. And we wonder why when life hits us, kind of all falls apart because we didn't build on anything solid because we didn't take the time to get deep enough to get to the heart and the core of who we are and what we believe and where our foundations are to let Jesus build something from there that would last. I don't know about you. I don't want to come out half-baked, right? I don't want to be half done. I don't want life to hit me and everything to fall apart. But for that to happen, I got to be willing to go deep and do some deeper work. And that freaks me out. Because when you start going deep, you start revealing some things in your heart and things you thought you knew. You ever have that moment where you thought you knew something and all of a sudden what you thought you knew wasn't true or wasn't as true as you thought it was and your foundation feels a little bit shaky and you're kind of like walking on nothing? Like, no? Well, wait, this series is going to be fun for you. <laughs> so as I was kind of looking back at what I preached on, I realized something, man. I, I throw out a lot of information at once. And uh, we're not going to do that this series. We're going to take our time. Here's what I promise. We will sing carols around Christmas time. Uh, I don't know how long this series is going to go, but I'm going to let it go. I feel as long as God wants it to. Because I don't know about you, but I know there's some stuff in my life that I need to work on. There's stuff in my life that I need to go deeper in. And I'm hoping that God will do the same in yours as well. So we're not going to rush. And we're not just going to point out issues. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to not only show us maybe where we have some stuff in our life that needs to get moved out the way, but what is the rock and the truth that we need to find so we can start building something? I don't want to just point out the issues. Anybody can do that. We can look below the waterline and go, yeah, that looks really bad. But how do we build from there? To me, that to me is where, where success is going to take place. So um, now, let's just have an honest moment, though. While I'm your pastor, I am not as comfortable in this situation. I went to school. I can do the Bible stuff. But when we start to go into feelings, like, anybody else like me? Anybody, like, not really a big fan of feelings? Yeah? Come on. Just support me this morning. Raise your hand. Thank you, my people. Thank you. Here's my background, man, with feelings is uh, I'm not perfect, and I really do struggle with emotions. But for a while, I was convinced I just didn't have them, right? Because, because in the world I grew up in, it just wasn't safe. To have feelings meant those could get really hurt. And when you're in an environment where those get hurt a lot, you learn to not have them. I had them when I was angry. And that was the thing. You couldn't hurt me because in a minute, in a second, I'd go from hurt to angry, right? I had a lot of anger issues. Um, and, you know, you're like, well, you're a pastor. And I'm like, dude, you need to understand, like, below my waterline, it's not as good as you might think. It's why I'm in counseling. It's why I'm doing this journey group because I understand if I don't keep working on me, I'll only ever go so far. And so if you came this morning and you need a pastor that's got it all together, I want to make you aware of the three exits in this church. You can... <laughs> 
head out anytime you need to because you will be disappointed. Um, but that's where we're going to go. And so, and I pray, man, as we, as we kind of get into this, that God will really speak to us. And here's some truth, man. You can invite Jesus into your heart. Hear me, like follower of Jesus, Christian, listen to me right now. You can ask Jesus to come in your heart. You can get real busy doing God stuff. Pray, read your Bible, go to church, and still not grow up, right? Because all that stuff is doing, but you're not letting God go and do what he wants to do. Um, and we all struggle. Like, here's the thing. We can get busy doing God activity and not deal with our false self. And that's one principle that's going to make its way throughout this entire series. Everybody in this room, we struggle with a false self, right? This idea of what we want people to think we are, but we're not really. And, and here's real, man. You don't even know you're living a false self because it's your reality and it's been your reality for a long time. And see, I don't blame us. I, I put it on our great, great, great grandparents like Adam and Eve because that's what this is about, right? They were in this garden. Everything was perfect, wonderful. God was good, naked and unashamed. No sh- Can you imagine living life with no shame? Seriously. Like people, when they talk about like, oh, I can't wait till I die. There'll be no more pain. Like the idea of no more shame is like better to me than pain. Like nothing in between me and the people I love. I don't have to hide. I don't have to pretend. I don't have to guard right? Like that to me is like, oh my gosh, how cool would that be? See, and that's what, what, what that was for these guys. But we know the story. Adam and Eve decided they were going to do it their way and not God's way. And the Bible says shame and they felt naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and they hid themselves. That's that false self. We hide. We're afraid that you get to see who I am. And if you saw me and you didn't like me, you reject me, what would happen then? And that's where this false sense of self comes from. Adam and Eve in the garden, we, we develop this false self. Here's a little quick assessment. that you can, I'm just going to read some things off. If any of these identify with you, you may struggle with this false self. I say yes when I really mean no. I get depressed when people are upset with me. I have a need to be approved by others to feel good about myself. I act nice on the outside, but inside I can't stand you. That's not my truth sometimes. I often remain (laughs) silent in order to keep the peace. I believe that I make mistakes. I myself am a failure. I avoid looking weak or foolish for not having the answer. I criticize others in order to feel better about myself. I have to be doing something exceptional to feel alive. I have to be needed to feel alive. I am fearful and can't take risks. I do what others want so they don't get mad at me. I use knowledge and competence to cover my feelings of inadequacy. I want my children to behave well so others will think I am good. And I compare myself a lot to other people. So if you're reading that list like I did, I was like reading, I'm like, okay, got it, got it, dang it, quit. All right, Pastor Chris, you can be quiet any time now, right? Um, all this stuff is coming from a book that I read a while back called Emotional Healthy Spirituality. Anybody ever read that book? On purpose? Right. Me neither. Okay. When somebody suggested it to me, I was like, are you kidding me? Like there's two words in there that turned me off from the very beginning. First, a book that says emotional on it. No. Right. And then a book on spirituality. Thank you. No, thank you. Right. I I don't know. I want to read that stuff. And so I avoided it for a while, but then I did start to go into it. And I started to realize, man, this guy has got some truth in there. He should have picked a much better title, but there's some truth in there and it's worth checking it out. And in this book, he talks about some of the things that we use to hide from ourselves or or to put put up our false selves. And the one that we're going to look at today is this one. It's this concept that we use God to run from God. This one is really hard to see in ourselves because it looks good and it looks right. And we've actually been taught to kind of live this way. The problem is, though, when we use God to run from God, we never let God into who we really are to do the deep work that he wants to do in our hearts and our lives. So we keep a surface idea of who God is without really letting God, like it's like we're, well, let me just read it. There's some, there's some things that he mentioned that I think we can all listen to. We'll spend all these hours doing God's stuff, but we don't let God deal with my stuff. 
We'll busy ourselves doing God's stuff, but when it comes to my stuff, I'm just going to stay busy. I prefer you not to go there. Uh, When I spend extra time in prayer and Bible study, the truth is these Christian activities sometimes are an unconscious attempt to escape from pain. We spiritualize our pain away. Oh, I just need to pray more. Oh, no, I just need to spend more time in the Word. Well, what about God letting actually go into your heart and start identifying where that pain comes from and how he can actually heal? Thank you, no thank you. I'll just pray more. Just read my Bible more because I don't want to go there because that risks being hurt again. Um, when my prayers are really about God doing my will and not me surrendering to his, when I use his truth to judge and devalue others, when I pronounce the Lord told me I should do this, when the truth is I think the Lord told me to do this, When I use Scripture to justify the sinful parts of my family, my culture, nation, instead of evaluating them under His Lordship. When I hide behind God talk, deflecting any spotlight on my inner cracks and becoming defensive about my failures. Ow. Anybody ever been the benefit of that? Anybody ever use that? No, no, don't look at me, man. Let's just... Be religious for a minute, right? And that's what he's talking about here. This is this false self that works its way out. When I apply biblical truth selectively, when it suits my purposes, um, but avoid situations that would require me to make significant life changes. If any of these describes you, then you may have some issues with your false self. And like our bridge illustration, here's the problem. If we don't get down to, think about the New York Bridge, right? I think they say about 1,600 cars or 16,000 cars pass over it daily. What if they didn't hit rock? What if it didn't make it all the way down to a deep foundation? What would happen? What could happen? Right? You could get hurt, but how many understand you could hurt a lot of other people too? And I think some of us, that's what we are dealing with. Some of us, our struggles with church and religion is because we have been around people that didn't do the deep work. And so when we came to them with our hurt, they try to over-spiritualize it and they try to throw some surface stuff at us. And it seemed like it was uncaring and not genuine. As I was kind of putting this message together, I was thinking about the fact that, and some of you, you might be sitting there going, why are we talking about this in church? This sounds like a counseling session. And I agree, like a few years ago, I made fun of this stuff. I don't want to talk about this stuff. I want to talk about Jesus. And you know why I don't think we've heard a lot of this? Because there isn't a lot of people that pay the price to go there. Man, it's just easy to preach. It's just easy to keep it all at the surface level. Because for me to take you there means I have to go here, and that ain't fun. And that means i got to go to places I don't necessarily want to go. But that's what this stuff is all about, is are we willing to let God go and do the deep work so it doesn't just help us and, 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 and heal us, but we're allowed to do the same for other people? One of the principles that he uses in the book that I think we cannot get away with is he says you cannot be a mature follower of Christ without being a mature person emotionally. And that requires work. You don't just pray that stuff away. You don't, you, some of us, we've got to grow up a little bit, right? We've stayed on the surface way too long. So whenever the wind blows, man, we're thrown around, and it's craziness. I, I put it this way, man. Maturity comes from growing up and building up. You have to build on something solid. Ask the Holy Spirit. This is my prayer for me and for you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help us see where I struggle and where I can build from. In a few minutes, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that I think really exemplifies some of this running from God, or running to God in order to run from Him. We're going to look at two characters in the Bible, right? Mary and Martha, and a time in their life where their brother died, Lazarus. And we're going to look at this difficult time, not only in their life, but in Jesus' life with the resurrection of Lazarus. Now, here's the background of this, because I think it's important to set the stage. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's ministering to all these people, and he gets word, hey, your your friend Lazarus is sick, and he's kind of dying. Could you come? And everybody thought Jesus would drop everything and run. And he didn't. In fact, he even said, He'll be all right. He's not going to die. He'll be good. 
Like, it even says the disciples were kind of shocked that he didn't respond because Jesus, not only he loved Lazarus, but he loved Mary and he loved Martha. And why would he not come? So the story goes on that um, he died. Lazarus dies. And people are really questioning, like, Jesus, why? Why wouldn't you respond? Here's, here's what's truth. God kind of disappointed at that point. Like, Jesus disappointed people. Let me ask you a question. You ever been disappointed with Jesus? God ever disappoint you? You ever ask him to meet something in your life, to do something for you that he did not do? You kind of look at him and go, I thought that would be different. I didn't think it would end up this way. If you would say to me today, Pastor, I've never been disappointed with God, I would say you struggle with false self because you're not honest with you and how you really feel. You've been taught somewhere that you can't be disappointed, that you can't express your frustrations, and that is not healthy. I can't, how could I be disappointed with God? He's perfect. Yes, but his plan doesn't seem perfect to me all the time, Right? And that's where these people were at. They were like, come on, man, you've got to come through for us. You know what? We're just going to read through this whole passage, and I'm going to, I'm going to take it apart. The verse starts in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Not only did he die, he'd been four days dead. He took a minute to get to these people. And I think it's important that the author points this out. Now, Bethany, where Jesus was, was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Or Bethany, where Lazarus was, was two miles from Jerusalem. When they sent him the message, he was only two miles away. That's a brisk walk. And he said, thank you, no thank you. I've got other stuff I've got to do right now. I could understand some disappointment right there. You were only two miles away. Like, could you just tell the people to wait? You'll come right back. You got to let us walk through all this. <clears throat> it says, many of the Jews come to uh, Mary and Martha to comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live and even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly, went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with uh, Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? There's a lot that just took place in there. And briefly, I'm going to take some of it apart. We're going to hit on some of it. And we'll get to more of it next week. So I want to look at a couple things. Now, if you've been raised in church, you know the contrast between Mary and Martha, right? Mary was the, uh, Martha was the busy one. She was the one like, if Give me some liberty with scripture for a minute, right? Most likely she was in the kitchen cutting carrots, getting the dinner ready, getting everything ready for what was going to have to happen for the funeral. And she heard that Jesus is coming. The Bible says she went because she was the busy one. She was the one that was always doing. She was the one that was upset with Mary. Mary was the contrast of Martha. Mary had the long hair, right? The flowing garment running through a field, yelling, Jesus. Like that's kind of the picture we get of Mary because when there was another interaction between Mary and Martha and Jesus, it says Mary was just sitting at his feet. And Martha's like, can't you tell her to get up and get some stuff done around here? Am I the only one that has to do anything in this house? 
right? That's kind of the whole concept that was taking place. And so um, it, it kind of brings us to this place that, and we've always been told you're supposed to be a Mary and not a Martha, and that's not what this is about, so we're not looking at that today. In fact, I'll be honest with you. Um, I believe when it says she was sitting at his feet, wasn't necessarily she was sitting there swooning. That was actually a term that they used for a disciple to a rabbi. I actually believe Mary was one of his disciples, based on what Scripture says. She followed him. That was unheard of in those days. That's why I have no problem with female pastors, because I believe that Jesus set that standard. Okay? Now, you want to debate with me theologically? That's later. Um, so, in this passage, I think there's a couple things, though, we need to point out. Number one is they're both missing it, just in different ways. Right? Jesus finally shows up. And if you would have been there, my brother wouldn't have died. They both said it. How many think they were having the conversation in the house before he got there? Right? They were talking about this. This had been the conversation in the house for a while. You know how it goes. We start talking like, ah, yeah, and if he would have showed up, I know if he would have been here, if he would have only came, right? And so as soon as they both see him, what do they both say? The same thing. If you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Come on, they were having that conversation before this. That's where that came from. And so, but I believe what, the reason that the author is pointing this out is we're supposed to look at the contrast, because there is a contrast. Martha, right, and, and we kind of explain her busyness. And so this is what it's like. Um, he, she's like, if you'd have been here, Jesus is like, but you can do this. And he's like, I will raise him to life. Yes, yes, I know. You will raise him in the, in the last day. It's almost like she's just taking her emotions and kind of stuffing it down, right? And I'm going to unpack that in just a minute. But I want to just look at a couple things. First, Mary says she ran, she fell at his feet weeping. When was the last time you felt at someone's feet crying about anything? Me, it's never. Right? Like, I can't even remember the last time I cried. Kind of a little bit yesterday at a funeral, but not, not totally. That's the, can I be honest? That's the one thing that scares me about this stuff. Some of the stuff I do, like, what happens when I'm going to be at a funeral and I'm not going to be able to stop crying? Oh, my gosh. That freaks me out. Anybody else? No? Some of you are like, no, I love a good cry. <laughs> you probably watch the Hallmark Channel, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> thought so. My wife says that stuff to me. She's like, no, I want to see a sad movie. I just need to cry. I'm like, why would I pay someone to make me cry? That makes no sense to me, right? That's because I'm a man, and that's, that I've got problems. So that, I'm working on those. So, um, but Mary, instead of expressing her emotions, she just opens the floodgates. She's just like, Bleh. Maybe that's the problem, is we don't have a real healthy balance with our emotions. Rather than stuffing it, we just like, Bleh, all over people. And that ain't good either. That's why this emotional healthy, this balance that we can learn that allows us to, to kind of move through things. But, um, and then there's Jesus. Now, this part messes me up, man. He's dealing with all this in a way that is incredibly interesting. Because, catch it, Jesus is catching some shade right here. Like three times over. Martha's like, if you would have showed up, this wouldn't have happened. Mary, if you would have showed up. And then there's these other people going, I thought you opened blind eyes if you would have showed up. Like Jesus is getting it right now like three ways. And these, these women, they loved him. They're all like team Jesus. And Jesus, he, they you know, confess Savior without question, that, that, but they're feeling disappointed by God. They're having a hard time. And then something happens, and this blows my mind. It says he cries. Jesus weeps over his dead friend. He doesn't suppress his emotions. He weeps with Mary. That makes no sense to me. Or it hasn't for a while. Here's why. Like, first of all, that word means something more than what we read it to be. He didn't like have a guy cry. Do you know there's a difference between men and women crying? Right? Men, we cry different. Uh, typically, it starts with the chin. Right? We try to hold it in. And like your chin starts moving. Right? And then you swallow hard. You know, and then like you're, you, I mean, you got to do it like somehow hard too. You know, like you're like, you, you fists wiping tears away, you know, like it's just not as natural. It's almost like it's caught up inside of us. And then typically what happens, like a little explosion, like you're like, <laughs> And we try to hold it all together, right? Man, one of my favorite things, favorite things, was I would go to 
um, detention centers, youth detention centers back then. I was invited to come in uh, once every five weeks to preach to these young men. And these dudes are hard. I mean, like, like they killed people, okay? And I start preaching, and, you know, they'd be like, yo, what up, you know? And as it started going on, like, eventually you would see it, and it would be like, Right? And you would see one of them wipe his eyes. Some dude looking at me like, what's wrong with you? Just shut up, man. Like, you're like about to hit each other and stuff. It was fun. I had a good time doing that. But, uh, <laughs> but it says he weeps with Mary. And, like, and this isn't, here's the deal. This word weep is not our word. It's not like he was having a guy cry. The Bible literally means it was like he was convulsing from his guts. Like this is probably a full snot cry. You ever have that cry? We're like just nasty cry. Ugly cry. Um, I, for real, the last time I think I ever had close to that was when my cat died. You're laughing. I would make fun of myself too. I was like sitting there thinking, this is a stupid cat. Why? And there's stuff with that that not now. But anyway, um, but this word Greek is, is, is this convulsed, uncontrolled, guttural weeping. So here's my question though. Jesus, why are you crying? Like, in about five minutes, you're calling that guy out of a grave. You know what's about to happen. You know, why would you waste emotion on this? Like, why be sad? If I was Jesus, I'd be walking up and being like, hey, you don't need to cry no more. Watch this. Hey, come on out. Ah, right? <laughs> How cool would that be? And it says Jesus just wept. Why? Because he was fully God and he was fully man. And the full experience of humanity requires joy and sadness. It requires emotion. Do you know what I'm starting to realize? I'm wondering how much I've really been alive. Because I don't let myself have full joy and I don't let myself have full emotion. I used to think, and I spiritualized it, right? Because what we do is we run to God to run from God. Because God wants to make me alive. What did he say? I came to give you life and life to the full. What I would want to do is I would say, and I would make it spiritual. I would say, I never go too high and I never go too low. I got to stay strong. I got to stay right in the middle because I'm a pastor. I'm going to have to do some funerals and I'm going to have to be the guy that can hold it all together. I'm going to have to walk into people's chaos and be the strong one. Yet here is the one who holds the universe in his hands, weeping, snot coming out of his face. Why? Because that's what it means to be fully alive. And though he knew he would raise him to life in just a few minutes, he allowed himself to go there. I now believe motions are not mountains and valleys. I believe they're railroad tracks. And I believe I can fluctuate from joy to sadness and there's nothing wrong with it. Now, to make these work, we're still working on that now, all right? Not trying to get to that anytime too quick, but. So he does that. He's fully God, fully man. I don't like it, but I believe it's true. So what I want to do, just for a few minutes, I want us to look at Mary and then we'll, we'll do more next week. Um, I want to look at that concept that I run to God in order to run from God. And I feel like we see that here. I want to revisit John eleven twenty one through 24. I want to show you a couple concepts that I believe can help us all in this struggle. It says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I run from God in order to run to, from, excuse, I run to God in order to run from God. Jesus looks at her and goes, your brother will rise. I know in the last day. Sunday school answer. I know it's going to get better in the end. 
I know one day I'm going to heaven and everything's going to be okay. Right? I know, I know. But here's the thing. Don't ask me to hope now because you've already let me down. She doesn't know what she's saying right now. Here's what she's doing. I'm avoiding that. Because you're, if, you're, if you're trying to mention to me, if you're trying to tell me right now that he's going to rise again right here and right now, I will not let my heart go there because you already let me down. And you could have been there. So I'm not going to go into that place because if I go into that place and get let down again, I don't know I'm going to make it. So I'm going to give you my quick Sunday school answer and we're moving on. Ouch. Don't ask me to hope now. I'm going to, she's using truth to deflect. Because Jesus is trying to speak truth to her now and she's talking about tomorrow. How many have we done that? I know one day it'll all, I know one day I'll have emotion. I know one day I'll be whole. Heaven! But don't ask me to go there now because if I were to go there now, that means I got to go deep into my heart and I don't know I want to go there because it's been a minute since I've done something like that. And Jesus is trying to minister her and meet her in her pain and Martha's like, hey, thank you, but no thank you. Let's just keep it up here. Let's just keep it truth to what we know. Here's the question is how many of us that Jesus wants to go into our heart and we go straight to our head because our heart has a no access sign? Jesus is like, hey, let me get in there. And you're like, oh, no, thanks. We'll just spiritualize it. Here's just a thought I had. God, and it's a question, maybe it's a prayer that you need to pray for yourself this week. Am I over-spiritualizing life? You are after my heart and I keep guarding with my head. And here's what's true. I'm not here to point anybody out because that's not my place. The Holy Spirit has to reveal that. That's not my job. But I would encourage you to ask. Am I making my life way more spiritual to keep you from getting into the heart of who I really am? To dealing with the stuff that really is affecting me? Am I keeping you at a distance? Am I keeping the truth that I know and I'm using that to guard my heart so that when you try to go there, I go right to my head? That's a lot. Barry, come on up. Here's my question. Are you willing to honest admit what you know about Jesus from Sunday school and church cliches may not be all that he is? Would you be willing to let God reveal a new part of himself to you that maybe you've never seen before? To enter into your world and reveal himself to you? It's scary because you think you got him all figured out, especially if you've been walking with Jesus for a minute. You think you got it all figured out. You think you got it all lined up. You think you understand it. Like this is what he does and this is how he treats people and this is how he responds to people. And then all of a sudden Jesus comes in and goes, can I mess that up? Because you know me, but you don't know me. We see that here. Before I go there, I'll go here. Because some of us, we've educated ourselves so we don't have to do the hard work. And it's not hard work, it's heart work. I can know truth and I can wield it like a sword. Why am I doing this work, this journey stuff? And for y'all, y'all who don't know, we got groups, they're going to be coming next year sometime. Oh, you're going to get the opportunity to do them. And it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be transformation. Honest to God, at times I hate it. But this is what I know. If I don't go there, how can I take you? And I'm called to lead. And you know what? Let's just be real, real, real. Like, I say that to sanitize it for me, but the reality is God has been wanting me to take me there because he loves me and he has nothing to do with you. It's better to say I do it for you. (sighs) Seriously, this series. He does that with Martha. Watch. She thinks she knows him. Watch. Here's what he says. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
the one who believes in me will live, and even though they die. Here's what he tells Martha. Martha, look, I am the resurrection. I will raise him up on the last day. You're right. You are right. I am your tomorrow, but I'm also your today because I'm life now. I'm not just resurrection tomorrow. I'm life today. And I've come to give you that life today. I've come to give you hope today in the midst of your hopelessness. And she's like, thank you. No, thank you. Because if I have to hope in you, that means I might get disappointed. And I'm perfectly fine not going there right now. See, and that's what I believe many of us, we do, is he wants to come in and say, look, I'm not just heaven and everything will be good in the end. I'm not just your fire insurance. I've come to give you life today. But life may mean you have to go back and deal with some stuff in your life because it's choking the life out of you. And the only way we get rid of that stuff is we get that like weeds. You got to get to the root and remove it. You can't leave it living. You can't just chop it off. You got to go deeper than that. Chris, I'm not just going to fix you when you get to heaven. I want you to have a fullness of life here on earth. See, but the problem is we know the part of Jesus that says we fix it. He'll make it better. But we're not willing to understand He wants to come in now. It's not just for tomorrow. It's for today. Which is why I follow Him. Because if He was only there to save me from the hell I got to go when I die, my question is, what about the hell I live now? I need more than that. And if he can't handle now, how can I trust him with tomorrow? But too often we settle for just tomorrow. And it isn't because he's not willing, it's because we're often not willing. Let's make it real life. Let me explain to you how this real works. And let me be honest with you. That what I'm about to share, I used to make fun of. And I used to over-spiritualize. I was talking to someone who was abused as a kid. So I asked him a question. I asked her a question. What would Jesus say about that? I'm like, well, Chris, what did you just... Listen, I can over-spiritualize with the best of them, right? When I would hear... Anybody ever hear that counseling before? Like, they go, all right, let's go back to your childhood and let's see Jesus there. Like, I went through that once and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, this was so weird and so foreign to me and so messed up. And why would I do this? Right? And then I even made it spiritual. I'm like, see, because the Bible says one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I press forward to what, right? Because I, I run to God in order to run from God. Because he wants to go deep and get to my heart. And I'm like, thank you, no thank you. And I'll even make it look spiritual. Man, I'm good. That's probably why I became a pastor. There's probably more truth in that statement than you really know. So I ask her, I say, what do you think Jesus would say? What would he do? Here's what's her response to me. She'd tell me to forgive them. Or he'd tell me to forgive them. That is the right Sunday school answer. But it's not right. Because now that I'm letting him go into my heart and really deal with some things, do you know what that says? He is a passive bystander in this destruction of your life. He's just watching. And instead of putting the responsibility back on the one that abused you, he puts it on the one who's been abused. And we wonder why we run from God and not to him. See, because when I only know that Jesus, how can I trust him? I come to him with my hurt and he puts more work on me. I come to him, he, he's watching, he's, he's, he's okay with what's happening to me in that season, in that moment, and now you want me to come and give my heart and, and follow him and, and lay my life before him and trust him? I struggled with that. So I asked her this question, hey, the Bible says he's a good father, right? Right? Could you see him yell at evil in that minute? Look at that abuser and say, get your hands off my daughter. You don't want me to put, you put your hands on her, I will put my hands on you. And you don't want that. Could you see him fighting for her, advocating for her? Could you see him grabbing the hand of the guy and holding it and saying, no, 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 no. No. Could you see him stepping in the way and taking the hit? 
And if you saw that Jesus, how could it change the way you see him now? Now, we all know there's free will, and we know there isn't this tangible Jesus that could have stepped in, but if you could see Him in that moment going, stop touching her like that. Get your hands off Him. It's my son. No! I don't know about you. I can trust that. I can trust that. But when I spiritualize Jesus and I make Him into this passive, milk toast kind of, oh, whatever, just forgive, how can I follow that? Some of you are like, Pastor, you're making it up. Really? How did He handle the woman that was caught in adultery? Did He condemn her or did He condemn everybody else around her? What did He do with the woman who came to Him and began to wash His feet with a questionable reputation? He didn't, they, no one said a word. They were just thinking stuff in their hearts. And Jesus called every one of them out and blessed her. I just think we know a piece of Jesus, but we don't know all of it. And until we're willing to go deep. But you see, here's what I know. When I get to that rock, I can build something from there. And it's going to last. Because the enemy ain't going to come in and kick that over anytime quick. Because I'm on a rock now. Because I know another side of Jesus. Oh, He might be loving for a minute, but mess with me and see what He does. Mess with you and see how He handles that person. See, do you understand the transformation that starts to take place when you allow God to go in and begin to transform the mindsets that you have of who you think He is? That is not who He is. He's more than that. The Jesus that I'm starting to understand. He is kind and he is just. He's defender of the weak and he fights for those who will not fight or cannot fight for themselves. And when I know him as that, then I can bring my true self before him. I don't have to hide. I don't have to keep playing around with the false self. I can come before him with my true self. And let him meet me there and begin to expose the stuff that's got to go. So let me ask you a question right now. Is Jesus just your resurrection today? Meaning, are you just not going to go to hell when you die? Because if so, you're missing out on this opportunity to let him be your life. And that's what he wants more than anything. Can you imagine like struggling through this whole existence with this messed up perception? You get to heaven and Jesus is like, man, it could have been so different. It didn't have to, you didn't have to live, you didn't have to suffer through all this mis- I'm not saying you're not going to go through hard times, but you didn't have to keep carrying the weight of your past and your mistakes and the things that have been done. Do you know I could have took that? Do you understand when we stand before him, the Bible says we will know and be fully known. I don't want to miss it. And the reason I'm doing this stuff, I want to know him. I want to know that Jesus. Do you know what my life could be like if I knew that Jesus when I was 15 years old? And that was the Jesus that I followed my whole life. Do you understand where I would be today? Not here. Not in the same spot I'm in right now. Not that I'm upset about that spot, but I don't know about you. I want more than where I'm at. And I believe some of you do as well. So this is what I want to do. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for you. This morning, if you're ready to let Jesus be your life, remember, resurrection is the tomorrow. Life is what we're talking about today. Mary, I am the resurrection in the last day, but I'm life for today. And maybe there's some of you in this room that you've never let him go to that place. Thank you, no thank you. And I get it. I'm telling my people in my group all the time, I'm so afraid to open these boxes. I don't know what's inside of them. And I'm afraid once I open them, I'll never be able to get it back in. And I feel like I've done all right up to now, but why would I keep going there? Because as I hold that box, I'm waiting for a resurrection to come one day, and he's saying, I've come to bring you life today. And you can trust me. 
hear that right now. Listen to what God would say to you. You can trust me. I built the foundations of this world. I'm the one that looked at the water and said, you can come this far and no farther. I'm the one that put every star in the sky. I'm the one that brought everything into orbit and everything into alignment. I'm the one that has restored brokenness. It's my job. Your stuff is easy for me. And it does not, it will not make me turn my head from you. In fact, here's what I believe. When I bring this to God, He doesn't turn from me, He turns to me. We saw it in that story. Martha, she stayed at the surface. Mary, she fell weeping. And what did Jesus do? Wept with her. Maybe that's the struggle today. Maybe there's some of you, you've been holding God at a distance for so long. Because how could you trust a God that allows all that stuff to happen? But this morning, I pray that you start to see Him in a different light that says, I am life. I'm not okay with those things. And I've come to restore what the enemy has happened. I'm sorry those things happened to you. I did not will those things. But I will not waste them either. I will take that pain and make something great out of it but you will not live in that place for the rest of your life. Heavenly Father, I pray for those people right now that know you as resurrection but have not experienced you as life. I ask right now, God, that you would start to do just a revelation of who you are. Just the reality of who you are and what you want to do. What you want to speak into their life. What you want to say to them. What you want to meet them at. Listen to me. Please hear me right now. This isn't a quick work. This isn't, I'm going to say a prayer and everything's going to be good. This is a step in the right direction of a brand new journey. But it's a journey that says, I'm not just holding on to try and make it. I'm not trying to just survive. I'm ready to start thriving. Because I'm not just going to live for a resurrection one day. I'm, I'm going to accept the life of Jesus right now. And you think I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, but you're so wrong. I'm talking to the one who's known him most of your life. Because the problem with us church people is we get taught so many right answers. We can regurgitate them on command. But our right answers are not life, they're information. Information doesn't change us, revelation does. And that's what Jesus wants to do to us this morning is reveal himself to us in our situation, in our scenario. And look, man, if I've opened up some stuff today and you need some help beyond this, reach out to us. We will get you the help that you need. We'll find you the right sources. He has life for you. Some of you, you've been walking around just holding on for way too long. And he's like, man, I've come to give life. So my prayer today, as the worship team comes and they sing this last song, is that you would receive that. And before I do that, though, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've never given your life over to Him, you don't even know Him as the resurrection yet. The Bible says it's simple. All you got to do is confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, ask Him to forgive you of your sins, invite Him to come into your heart. But hear me, it's more than a prayer. It's a choice to follow. But when you know He's good like that, it's easy to follow. God, would you just reveal to your kids today how good you are. You're a good father and you love deeply. Bring us life today. In Jesus' name, amen.